time to be disruptive. Everyone's heard of 3D printing. You're all familiar with it. You've heard it in the news. It's been on the TV. And you've heard amazing claims about what it can do and how it's going to change our future. It's been called by some the disruptive technology of the decade. I'm not going to talk to you about the technology of 3D printing. And I'm not going to speculate on what the world's going to look like in a world of 3D printing. What I want to talk about is you and how 3D printing can help you reach your potential, how it can help you craft your future. Now, the most important thing, in fact, the only thing you really need to take away from this session, the only thing I want you to remember is that everything I'm... Oops, let's jump back a second. You can do this. Everything I'm going to talk about is stuff that you can do. You can do it right now. At least wait till the end of the talk, but it's stuff that you can do. Keep that in mind. I work at the University of Melbourne, and my job is to look at emerging technologies and introduce them to the research community. It's a pretty cool job. About 10 years ago, a colleague of mine came and told me about this thing called additive manufacturing, where an object could be created one slice at a time, built up these thin layers until the object was solid, complete. Called it 3D printing. And I admit, at the time, my response was, that sounds impractical. It, I could understand the slicing. We work with CT scans and that kind of thing. But I thought it would be slow. You'd be limited to the kind of materials that can be deposited in, the, in that manner. And if you had to build anything that, like a bridge or anything that needed had an overhang, you'd have to have support. So I, I, uh, I dismissed it. Anyway, in 2011, I went to a conference and they had on display what would have been, I guess, 50 3D printers. Everything from big several hundred thousand dollar machines right down to the one thousand dollar do-it-yourself kit. And I could see them printing. I could watch them work. I could pick up the pieces that they'd made and that's when it clicked. That's when I got it. That's when I understood that 3D printing not only could but would change the way we do things. Now, I'm not going to suggest I fully appreciated the reach 3D printing would have but I knew it would be big. So I was very keen to get our research community doing this kind of work. Meanwhile, a young PhD graduate by the name of Ben, working with uh, lasers diffracting in crystals, and he had a problem. He had some equipment that he purchased in America and some more equipment that he purchased in Europe. Not exactly sure where. But the problem was, one was in imperial measurements and one was in metric. So we needed to have these two pieces of equipment mounted rigidly together for the experiment. So we had to create a bracket. He sketched up a design, took it to our engineering workshop, and they said, yes, we can make that out of aluminium. It'll cost you $800 per piece. He needed three or four of these. And it will take four to six weeks. Now, Ben had the experience that many research students have. Hopefully, some of you will be research students soon. He was told by his supervisor, we don't have the budget for that. You have to find an alternative. So Ben got online. He looked up, how do you make a custom bracket? And he found a video of a 3D printer. First time he had seen or heard of 3D printing. So he had a look on the Melbourne Uni website. Is anyone doing 3D printing? And he found my name. Two hours after being told that he had to find an alternative, Ben was standing in my office watching a 3D printer in action. He then was interested in doing this himself, so I pointed him at some software. He'd never done any 3D modelling before. He had a go at the software. The next day, I got an email from him with a design for a bracket. It looked all right to me, so we printed it out. Sure enough, it fit perfectly. Now, this isn't typical of the way the process works, but it's a very good example of how it started. A colleague of Ben's from the same lab saw this and decided he had an experiment that he was having trouble running, but it would work with a particular bracket. So he designed his bracket, a little bit more complicated than this. It had lots of subcomponents. Now, we printed it out. It didn't fit. He'd made a mistake in his measurements, simple as that. His first response was to go through and scale each of those individual components to compensate for the height discrepancy. But I said, no, just tell me how tall you want it, and I'll make it that tall. I'll scale it in one hit. It took me two seconds to type in the number, the height, 
printed it out and it fit perfectly. So that's what 3D printing happens. It goes back and forth. Now, Ben, having had the experience of identifying a problem, designing a solution and printing it, he now understood how 3D printing could fit into his, his experiments. And so his next design was something much more complicated. He designed this. It keeps a laser travelling across a surface, a crystal surface. I don't understand all of that. But this was his second design. Now, Ben finished his PhD before he got the opportunity to actually build this. However, some students in his lab did follow it through and made it. And it works. Now, this is about the iterative design process. There's a lot of different processes that we could talk about. This is the one I like. Design, build, refine. We used to spend a lot of time on design because build was so expensive. And that left very little for the refine. 3D printing, 3D printing allows us to flatten that. We don't have to spend as much time on design because the build refine, sorry, build, refine process can be done so many times now. Now, I don't want to suggest in the design phase that the, the physical, pr physics principles and the uh, chemistry, engineering, all of that still matters. It's still important. But we can be much more experimental in our design as we progress. And we can do these things more efficiently and faster. Now, I want to talk a bit about Dr. Phil. Not the Dr. Phil, just a Dr. Phil, who uh, is still a very important Dr. Phil. Now, He's a bowel surgeon and he conducts, uh, there's a particular operation he does called an ileostomy where they remove the lower part of the bowel because it's diseased or whatever and they create a sac for the partially digested food. Now this has to be emptied and at the moment the tube that they use for this is number one, very expensive, and number two, it's actually not designed for this purpose. So Phil realised that he needed something for these patients that was customised to them. For example, the distance between the stomach entry point and the valve is different for each patient. So a single length tube wasn't going to work. They needed something that could be customised to that patient. He also realised that having a straight tube didn't work very well either. It was very difficult to get on into the inner valve. So he created a curve. He also realised that having, a, having bigger holes meant less blockage. Trouble is, bigger holes also means more chance for those holes to catch on the valve or the stomach wall or something. Let's see if the thing works now. So he came up with this design. Very simple tube. It costs very little. We can print them very easily. And it can be customised for the individual patient. By putting those bigger holes on the inner curve, it doesn't catch as it's being inserted. He also put on the flange so that it can be inserted exactly to the right depth because it's for that patient. It knows exactly how far it has to go. And that flange can also be used with a belt so that once it's in, they can let, let go, they don't have to hold on to it, they've got two hands free. So I want you to think, what's your story? I've worked on a whole lot of different projects, some of them big, some of them small, these are a couple of interesting ones, but I want you to think, what it is it that you're exposed to? In your, at work, at home, at, when you're at sport, or whatever, what are you exposed to where this could be your story? So you might have heard this expression, building a better mousetrap. When I was little, this was the only mousetrap I was aware of. Now, I'm not saying there weren't other mousetraps, there might have been. But this was the only one I was aware of. Uh, it's the only one you could go into the supermarket and buy. It works. It worked really well. You put a bit of peanut butter or cheese on there and it would do the job. But I hated setting them. It would snap at your fingers. And it, that was kind of freaky. So I didn't like them. These mousetraps came on the market recently. They aren't better in terms of, they don't catch mice any better. They're not cheaper, they're actually a little bit more expensive, and they're not more robust. Why do I like them? Because I can set it like that. I can step on it. My fingers are nowhere near it. I'm actually wearing a steel cap boot in that shot. So the mousetrap is better, not because it's, it's cheaper or does a better job, it's easier to use. So when you think a problem is solved, there may still be some room for improvement. 3D printing, understanding 3D printing, can change the way you address a problem, the way you see problems. If you have gone through the process of identifying a problem, designing a solution, and printing it out, and having it in your hand, you will have that becomes part of your mindset on how you address a problem. 
3D printing can overcome traditional manufacturing limitations. Now, my generation and the ones before me, when we wanted something this big, we took something this big and cut it down, what we would now call subtractive manufacturing. Now, the way we were taught to design things, to build things, always took into account the limitations of our production methods. But you don't have to do that. You can have 3D printing as part of your design method. And we see this quite a lot in our engineering students. They're embracing 3D printing and they're doing a great job. But one thing I do see with them is they have a tendency to use the 3D printer as a cheap way of creating something that they could have created in a traditional way. And what we want is for them to create things with a 3D printer that only a 3D printer could create. We want to see new designs. And that's why this is the best time to be involved in this, the best time to get involved. As I said, my generation and the one before, we've got this legacy mindset of how we design things, and we are overcoming it, but it's a slow process. The generation that follow you, 3D printing will be ubiquitous. It'll be everywhere. Now, talent will still rise to the surface. It always does. But you are in a box seat. You are in the best position because you can ride this first wave of innovation. The, the hardware is so much more accessible. The software, there's tons of free software. All of this is available to you right now and the field is wide open. So you can get involved and do some amazing things right now. Don't wait. Every time you see a little problem, every time you see something where the solution is almost right, almost doing the, the right job, but could be better, that's an opportunity for you to make the change for you to improve it. There's a lot of different avenues that you can get involved in 3D printing. You might be the kind of person that likes to build, work on electronics, actually create the printers. The printers are evolving so fast right now, there is a lot of opportunity to get involved in helping craft the next generation of printers. But you might be somebody who's more into the materials. You might be more interested in what materials are being used. I'm not. You might be more like me. You might not really care about how the 3D printers work or what they print with. I liken it to uh, writing a fantastic screenplay. No one is going to say, wow, what word processor did you use? <laughs> it doesn't matter. I like to create things that are functional, that do something. It's more of an industrial design type of thing. But you might be creative. You might like to create something artistic, something expressive. Or you might be inventive and we want to create something that no one's thought of. That opportunity exists right now. Start small. You do not have to change the world with your first design, or even your second. There's a lot of pressure on your third design, but grow your ideas. You have to start, OK? Once you start, once you've designed something, identified a problem, designed a solution, printed it. Once you've got that in your hand, even if it's not beautiful or functional or even useful, You'll have that process in your head and you will start, the ideas will start to grow. Collaborate. You do not have to be a genius working in isolation to be a success. Working with other people, more minds contributing to a solution provide a better solution faster. And the collaboration doesn't have to just be with the people immediately around you or in your vicinity. It can be with people online. Collaboration can be done where somebody in one country designs something for a particular purpose. I, I find that file online and I change it for my purpose. And then somebody changes it from there. We get an evolving design. Now, you might think, I don't have access to a 3D printer. I don't know anybody with one. How do I start? There are cheap 3D printers, but I'm not suggesting you have to go out and buy them. There are already, if your school doesn't have a 3D printer, it will soon. Libraries are starting to put 3D printers in. But if you don't have access to that, I mean, there's universities and colleges, but you can also create a design and put it online. They will print the model out in whatever material you want and send it back to you. Obviously, it will cost you some money. And there's also things like 3D hubs, which is a service where people register their printer and then you can, if you pick printers from your area, that they will print stuff for you and send it to you. And that will cost you a little bit of money too. But right now, you can get started. There is an enormous amount of software. 
You could be downloading software onto your phone right now. Don't, but you could. There's an, an amazing array of software. Some of it is incredibly simple to use, but will produce amazing things. And some of it is incredibly powerful and hard to use, but will produce incredible results. The thing is, it's already there. It's available. You can download it now, tonight, on the weekend. You can start designing things straight away. Free software and your imagination, which you already have in abundance, is a new creation. It's, you can create something that no one anywhere in the world has ever created. You have that opportunity right now. So think to you, ask yourself, what could you create? Your generation are coming into a, a, a new era where you can create just about anything that you can imagine. And that hasn't always been the case in the past. It was too expensive or whatever. But now, that opportunity exists. And it is going to get more... There are more and more people will start doing this. So right now is a great opportunity for you to get in and be at the front of the pack. Remember, you can do this. Every single one of you sitting in front of me can start doing this. Thank you.